on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino. We recap OU's win over Kent State and some of the other great games in week two of college football. And then we finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, September 12th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades, and hearts go gamble at riverwind people it's fun you'll enjoy it and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of september visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now we're recording this sunday night please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment while you're at it ted how we doing man doing fantastic another fun weekend of football in the books and uh Ready to talk about this one, put it behind us, and uh, and go to Lincoln. It it was a wild weekend of college football. And the the first half of OU Kent State contributed to that as well. So <laughs> yeah. where it was one of those where we're like, wait, what's going on here? Right. And since I, I it was the first game I haven't been at in a really, really long time. I'm just watching all of this on my phone, by the way. Wedding timing was perfect. Ceremony right, was the duration of halftime. I believe I missed <laughs> the first four snaps of the second half, and that was it. <laughs> was able to watch every step of the game. That's perfect. That's hilarious. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. But we want we want to be positive. So let's start with the defense. I, I think. Uh, I think everyone's really, really excited about how this defense is coming together. What'd you think? Yeah, I thought, I thought all in all it was uh, another really solid performance. Thought, thought you had guys that played really well on every level. Um, I thought the defensive line. I thought uh, Isaiah Coe was an enforcer. Um, I thought Grimes had another really solid game. He's starting to to really find find his home out there. I thought Johnson played played pretty well at times. Uh, I got frustrated at him at one point in the game whenever he missed a missed a easy tackle for loss, but um, he played a good solid game. Uh, that that one play was was just a little hiccup. Uh, so defensive line coming along. Really, really well. Even Redmond, uh, Redmond, you know, had a flash for a couple of really nice plays where you can see the type of damage he can do on the inside. It's just, it's a deep, solid rotation that the deep defensive line has going right now. I thought Danny Stutzman played an excellent game. Um, I think Coach Coach Vittable said that he graded out like in the mid '80s in Week One. I think this one's going to be way better. It wasn't perfect. There was a couple of things that, you know, a couple of hiccups there that that cost them some some decent yardage. But he's coming along really well. Four tackles for loss, incredible. He's coming downhill. He's starting to gain some confidence. You know, the more he understands, the more you can see him using that that physicality, using his size as an asset, running around making tackles. Um, I thought Bowman had yet again a. a a superb day was all over the place in the secondary. And, you know, I thought our corners played well. They came out, tested us deep a couple of times. And I thought our guys held up really well. Um, may have got away with a little bit of a tug on a jersey here and there, but um, I think that's good. You you do that until they flag you for it. So all in all, whenever you just kind of scan the entire game, I thought it was I thought it was all around really solid. 
yeah, I, I agree. The thing that when I, when I watched it Sunday morning, you know, watched it back, the thing that stood out to me was the D line, man, it, it's starting to look better. You know what I mean? Like just how yeah. physical those guys are, how violent they are at the so point of everything's attack. behind the line of scrimmage. There's so much there's in, in the backfield on every single play. And Kent State, they are a team, you know, I think, what was it? They were the third leading rushing team in, in all of FBS last year. Like, they, they've got some schemes. Like, you know, Sean Lewis, their head coach, knows, knows how to dial some stuff up in the run game. So, to stuff the run the way that they did, really, when, when you look at the defensive performance, Ted, the only thing you can really complain about is like, hey, we know we're going to play some some really mobile quarterbacks mm -hmm. in Big 12 play and Colin Schley he got he got loose with his legs a little bit that's yep. probably what that's probably the number one complaint yep he had he had the longest run of the day a 17 yard run um where he just i don't know how he made it through all of those guys but he did and i think the longest pass of the day at least it was the longest at one point was a free play off of a uh, off of an offsides. So longest play you gave up all day was 24 yards. Still haven't given up anything really explosive. That's the longest play of the season so far is 24 yards. All in all, I think they've they've done an excellent job. Just you know, two totally different styles of offense, and they've contained both of them really well. Yeah, and we you know coming off the opener, we talked about how how the tackling looked noticeably different a lot, a lot of guys around the football you still it, it it looked good to me watching it back it seemed now you're you're going to have some missed tackles here and there but seemed like once again getting a lot of guys to the football getting guys on the ground i was smiling ear to ear when Jaden Davis and Billy Bowman bullied that guy and took the football from him, that, that <laughs> gave me a nice, that gave me a nice chuckle, but it, it seems like the tackling was really, really solid again. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's paid dividends. Um, they're flying to the football, you know, and I, I've said this a million times, so excuse me for that, but, the, the best way to tackle is knowing where you fit in the framework of a defense. And when you've got a bunch of guys that understand where they're supposed to be and know how to miss or know where to force a guy, it helps the entire team tackle. And so far we've seen them do a really good job of that. Now it's going to continue to get cranked up, right? Like we've, we've outmatched these opponents big time, but we've, we've made them look the way it should look, you know, defensively we've, we've dominated the line of scrimmage. We've tackled well in the open field. We've had pretty much constant pressure on the quarterback. Like those are all the things that you're really looking for. We haven't given up uh, a bunch of explosive plays. Haven't had free runners in the secondary. Those are all really positive things. Yeah. The, the one thing, and you mentioned guys just being back in the backfield, 14 TFLs. That's a big number, man. It's huge. And, yeah. and you look at, you look at, you know, how many plays they ran. They probably ran somewhere between 60 and 70, maybe, maybe a little over 70. And to have 14 TFLs on that amount of plays. Like, yeah. It's like every, you know, every five plays is a negative yardage play. Yep. I mean, that is, uh, I'm sure Kent state staff looking at, at that going, Oh boy. That uh, that's not winning football, but that's 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 really good stuff for OU's defense, man. Well, they've had to defend a bunch of plays. I don't remember what the numbers were in Week One. I know I have them somewhere, but their their yards per play that they're giving up is really low. You know, I I know the 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 yard totals have uh, haven't been like something where you're like wow, that's that's a really impressive day defensively, but. Their their yards, they've done a really good job. I mean, I I don't have many complaints. There's a couple of times where you have the chance to get off the field and you don't. I mean, there's some of that stuff, but you know, you're two you're two games in running a new defense 
at this point, I'm, I'm happy with what I see. Yeah. And you, you give up 295 yards of total offense to, to a team that a lot of people think are going to play for their conference title. Now we'll see. It's a long season there in the Mac. Don't get me wrong, but also with the mobile quarterback, like Schley and, and the Cephas kid, that, that kid's good. Yeah. So to and the limit stuff you gave up is like, like you could almost single out like most of the plays where most of the yardage came and say, like I said, that one was a free play where we jumped off sides. Um, two plays, you know, Harrington had 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 him dead to rights in the backfield and just, you know, came a little bit out of control and he'll, he's going to get that fixed. Was, you know, anxious out there trying to do. Uh, you know, trying to do too much, which is, you know, which is fine. Like those, he's going to settle into some of those plays and Stutzman, they got Stutzman on a little, like a, a, a kind of a gadget play to the tight end on a, on a counter look where he just continues down the field on a pass play. Like just some of those things that they're not, they're not schematic or philosophical problems with what you see out there. Like, oh my gosh, we've got, we've got an issue with this that people are going to continue to exploit. I, I don't see anything like that right now, which, which is nice, right? Which is nice. But I mean, just looking at the team and we'll, we'll talk about the offense's performance, just looking at the team, right? It, it is, am I crazy or is it starting to feel like the defense is the strength of this football team right now with what we've seen. And I know it's, Hey, it's only two games, but with with the defensive line appearing to come along a little bit and, and get some more consistent play from more guys and them just being technically sound, not giving up big plays, that, man, it feels like, I don't know, that's just how it feels to me. It feels like the defense is the strength of the football team right now. It definitely feels like that. And, you know, one of the ways to kind of tell is how does the crowd respond? And we've got a defensive crowd again. Third down, all of a sudden is, you know, it doesn't just take a big game, a big, like a big time opponent and a big moment in the game for the crowd to get going on third down. Now, every single third down, they're up, they're loud, they're, they're you know, feeling uh, like they're a part of the defense, forced a, forced a delay of game call because of a loud crowd. So, yeah, I, I – I think like whenever you see that the crowd is responding to them, I think that makes you feel like they're, they're kind of the lead pony right now. Yeah. And the, the way the offense played in the first half probably had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's time to, do, do we have to, should we just skip? Can, can we just pretend the first half didn't happen? Come on. Come you know on. what's funny though? Here's what I'll tell you. I, I knew they were having their struggles and, but at no point, I, I, I was never the least bit worried. Not only that it was like, we have a chance of maybe getting upset here by Kent state. I, 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 I felt totally fine the entire time that they were going to come away, score some points, get some separation. And we we're going to be just fine. I, I never worried about it. And I think some of that was it wasn't going good. And I think they could have transitioned to some different things to kind of change like what they were doing and try and hit some some exploitable parts of Kent State's defense. But, you know, they're going to see this front later in the season multiple times. And I think it was Levy saying, guys, this – this is our stuff. We have to find a way to block it up, move some people off the ball and be able to attack this front. Whenever they're giving us a light box, we've got to be able to run the football. And that's why he kept doing it over and over and over trying to establish that mindset. And, you know, whenever they needed to switch gears, they switched gears. Yeah. So I, I think the best way to do this is because I think a lot of people watched the game, saw the first half offensively, saw the second half and said, what, what, what the hell? 
right? What, what went wrong in the first half? And, and as I watched it really carefully, it was, it was a combination of a lot of things, right? Because what your first two possessions, you're three and out and then four and out, right? Uh, I mean, you are, you run seven plays the first two times you touch the football and you look at it. I just, you, you've got to, you've got to play better along the offensive line, right? And, and it's not, it's not just the physical part of it, right? Now you got to get movement. You got to come off the ball. You got to block the right guys, but like second play of the game, they run, they motion a wide receiver and the backers bump backer bumps in the box, which you should know that's going to happen with the play call, with the motion, a backer bumps into the box and no one blocks him. He's unaccounted for. How does that happen? That that's my thing. It's like those, those mistakes can't happen, but you need to know where you're going. You need to know who you're blocking. It's hard enough to win the battle against defensive linemen with how freaky some defensive linemen Kent state didn't have any of those guys, but so you need to know exactly what you're doing. And that's not just who, who am I working with? Like you need to know how the defense, the picture of the defense can change when they're shifting motion. But I, it's the I, one advantage that you carry into every snap is, you know, where you're going and you know what you're running and you know how to block it. And if you don't have that advantage, you're going to find yourself in a, a really difficult football game. Uh, absolutely. And the, the bottom line was Kent State was giving them a five-man box and, oh, you couldn't run it against it. They couldn't move them off the football. That's problematic. Yep. It is. Right now, you saw some better stuff in the second half, right? Started finding some running lanes. But when you look at the first half and what the major issues were, I, there's, too, there's way too much stalemating at the line of scrimmage. A like guy's not getting movement. Like two, you're double teaming a guy. Move his ass. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you you have to create movement at the line of scrimmage. There's way there's way too much stalemating, and there's just I, I a lot of times I feel like they don't know which linebacker they're working to, and I don't know how that's possible because what Levy runs. You know, from a run game perspective, it's not overly complicated stuff. Right. So you've got unblocked inside linebackers. When you're running into a five-man box, like, block the inside backer. What are we doing? I, so I, I was confused watching the lack of execution in the run game in the first half. I, now, I will say, some of the times when they did block the right guys, right? Backs are one-on-one -on -one with defensive backs. That's the running back's guy in the run scheme, right? You say, hey, this guy is not going to be blocked. Make a miss. And in the first half, they weren't making guys miss. In the second half, they did. They, they, made, they made some guys miss. You, the, the Marcus Major run was, oh, my God. That was great. Uh, but Dylan Gabriel, right? The long one, what did he rip off? I think it was like 44 yards. He's one-on-one -on -one in space. Everyone's blocking it properly across the board. He makes a guy miss explosive run. So when you look at what went wrong in the first half, it was bad blocking, uh, a lack of I identifying where you're going in the run scheme. And you were in a bunch of, you were in, third and forever situations and they just got to play coverage Ted like I yeah. it, it's not I know some people are going to be like well you know it's getting no there's got to be more to it than that it really who wasn't. do we kill yeah like <laughs> who do I blame it, and the frustrating part for me watching it was it was guys taking turns right which yeah. hey one guy messes up another guy messes up that it's got to be more consistent uh, across the board. And really, I, I thought Dylan Gabriel was pretty good in the first half. He didn't, yeah. he, he, with the way that it, that that game was going, you could have understood him maybe trying to force some things 
right? Like that nervous energy, you know, the, the crowd starts murmuring yeah. a little bit like, what, what, what's going on here? Right. So he, he could get a little antsy, maybe try to force something in that first half. And he didn't. And I thought that showed quite a bit of maturity uh, with how the game was going up to that point. He, he was a little late on a few throws. He takes, he takes some interesting sacks. He could just throw it away instead of taking the sack and losing the yardage. So uh, I'm sure that's something that Levy will, will talk to him about. I know he wants to hold on to it and try to make a play, you know, and hold it and hold it and try to make a play as late as he can. But it, not, I, I'm not really now as a former O lineman, it's like, hey, those sacks make the O line look bad when really you're the one just holding the football, man. Get rid of that thing. Right. But the one thing that I really am not a fan of about it is like he's, he's taking some unnecessary hits. In yeah. those situations too. So it, is that kind of how you saw some of the some of the stuff in the first half? Yeah, you know, I thought I thought his mental clock, Dylan Gabriel's got a little off. Like like I think he's not in a great place confidence wise with where the offensive line is. Uh, because there's a couple of times they've had free hitters just right off the gate, didn't identify the front for whatever reason and and had guys that were unblocked. And I think that's kind of thrown him off to where maybe his eyes aren't downfield like they should be. And he's kind of watching the rush and it's just kind of, kind of changed the way he's approached things. And I thought it was way better in the second half. Um, yeah. And I agree in, in the running game. I thought, I thought in the second half, you know, they started doing, started doing that one back power um, I think one of the one of the first plays that they went to in the second half was more of an outside zone, and that had a little bit better uh, result to it. You know, I, I, it just they got in a better rhythm and were able to use their tempo early on. When you're not getting it, if you don't get six seven yards on first down in the running game, you can't. I mean, doing tempo is not doing you any good. Like, you're you're just. <laughs> you're rushing to the sideline at that point is about all you're doing. And, you know, once they were able to start hitting on some of those runs on first down, they were able to use that tempo to their advantage. And the next thing, you know, boom, 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 they score three times in a row. And all of a sudden you feel way different about the football game, but yeah, I, it was just interesting offensive line wise. It guys felt seemed unsure. And I know those fronts and they were doing some weird things with it, but, um, I'm just glad we got a good look at it with this offense before, you know, you play a Baylor or an Iowa state. Cause it's, that's, it's, that's a totally different animal, same, same system, same scheme, but a totally different level of player and a totally different level of understanding what it is they're doing. That's this team's first year in that scheme. Yeah. So it was, it was discouraging. Yeah. Right, that it didn't look better in the run game earlier. And I, I'll be interested to see if we see Levy start transitioning the run game more to, you know, kind of attacking the edges of the defense because you, you look at the interior, like the way that they're doing some of this stuff with it, it's, it's really not even inside zone because it very rarely goes to the front side. Um, but the way that they block, like you need, you need guys in the interior that are mauling people, right. That are getting movement that are distorting the line of scrimmage. And that's, that's not what you're getting from the interior of this offensive line. Currently, it's just not. So do they, do they start attacking the edges, you know, put some more outside zone in, put some pin pull stuff which I, I've seen Levy run in the past. So I, I don't know. I'm interested to see where the philosophy goes moving forward because they're going to be, they're going to play teams that are a lot better than that defensively. And if you couldn't get the type of movement now block the right guys, that, that would also help a lot, but it, it's just going to be interesting to see how it evolves. If he starts looking at his O line going, okay, now maybe we don't do this so well. Let's let's try to find something else maybe that works. So I I don't know, but I did think Marcus Major looked great. Yeah, he did. 
I, I mean, that touchdown run was sweet. And the best part about it, offensive line, five guys blocking five guys, hat on a hat. He bounces it outside to an unblocked guy. That's his guy. Make a miss, go score. It's exactly what he did. And he embarrassed that poor guy. I mean, that, that was, was awesome. That, that was, was awesome. But uh, along with Eric, I thought Eric Gray, once again, did some good things. Um, I, Who's the better runner? Is it too early to tell? I just, I, I would assume my, my eyeballs tell me Marcus major, right? Like, yeah. I mean, he's just got a little more, he got a little more horsepower to him right now. The stuff that Eric gray can bring you in the passing game and all that stuff. And it seems like Eric gray is doing a pretty good job, you know, cause that was one of my complaints about him last season. How good was he in blitz pickup in those types of situations? He seems to be pretty assignment sound with all that uh, up to this point. But, yeah, I, it, it's a great one-two combo. Yeah. I, I, I feel pretty dang good about where we're at running back-wise. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of conversation as to who's the better guy and who should be number one and who should be number two. And I honestly don't really care. I just like that we have two guys. It's a really good one-two combo. Yeah. Okay, wide receivers. Marvin Mims is good, man. Yep. <laughs> he, he's, what, seven for 163, two touchdowns. Just had a you – know, I thought he had the biggest impact of anyone on the football game right? for OU's offense. I that mean, first touchdown was – that was a beautiful throw by Dylan Gabriel, but just an amazing route, great catch, just a beautiful play all the way around. And it was much needed. Yes, it was. Right? Because if you head into that half with zero points on the board, I mean, it would, it would, I, it got them a little momentum heading into the half. I'm sure there was a uh, spirited conversation in the locker room. And then, and then they got it rolling in the second half. Uh, I mean, they did some really good things in the second half, but, you know, Mims' second touchdown. That was a result of the tempo, right? Defense yep. wasn't lined up. Coverage wasn't communicated. You leave the best wide receiver on the field uncovered and you let him score an easy one. That's about as easy as it's ever going to be for, for Mims. Any other wide receivers kind of stand out to you? I thought Theo Weaves had another um, solid performance. Um, Drake Stoops, you know exactly what you're going to get from him. Night the in, touchdown night out. was that sweet. Was awesome. He just kind of like dead bodied in the air. That was that was so cool. Um, yeah, I, I I still keep hoping that they're going to let Jaden Gibson get out there and get a little more time on the field. But um, they had one opportunity with him. But so far, kind of it it's been Marvin Mims' show. Theo Weiss right. is is kind of your number two. They've had a couple of tries to get Jaleel Farouk going, and it just hasn't worked yet, but I I feel totally confident that it's going to. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Uh, we, Theo, he looks pretty explosive he right does. now. He looks good. Looks good Which, after the catch. Yeah, it's, it's good to see him out there healthy. And you're right about Farouk. It just not getting many touches right now. The ball's just not finding them, but I will give him some credit. You know, going back – I probably pay more attention to wide receiver blocking than a lot of people do. And even though he's not getting the rock a ton, uh, Farouk is, he, he's getting after it as a blocker. So I think, yeah. uh, which is impressive when, especially when you're not catching many passes, tight ends wise, didn't see, did we see one snap to 12 personnel? One. I think it was one, right? Yep. And maybe they're and just the saving split, that stuff. The, the, the edge guy split right in between both of them almost made the play in the background or in the backfield. Yeah. So <laughs> not ideal, <laughs> but I, yeah. So we talked about that heading into the game. How much would we see of Braden Willis and Daniel Parker on the field together? I assume starting with Nebraska, we'll see some more of that. Maybe they just didn't want to show any of that stuff. Any of those wrinkles they'll have with those guys, Braden Willis, I thought he once again did a really good job as a blocker. And then, I mean, had a few drops right now. They weren't perfect throws, 
but once I'm sure if you asked him, he said, yeah, I got to catch that. So he could have that, that play, I think it was to start the fourth quarter, the one down the middle, that, that yeah. could have been a big, big play for him. And just, I don't know, kind of spun him around weird. He just couldn't hold on to it. But I, I continue to be very impressed with, with what he's doing as a blocker, just and, and bringing physicality to that tight end position. It's impressive, man. Yep, he looks good. Uh, Daniel Parker looked good. He he caught a couple of balls out there. He was a he's a horse to bring down. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Like th- we're going to see more of those guys on the field together. It's just a matter of when and and you know in what scheme is it going to work the best against, and when do they feel like they're going to break it out. Um, you know, I definitely helps in protection if, if you need to need to go max pro and stuff like that. So I think those guys will continue to go be a big part of the offense. And I, I think I would expect to see as you face tougher and tougher defenses to see the tight ends end up being more involved, both like both guys on the field, uh, maybe in protection and also like easy throw and catch stuff, almost check down, like chipping the edge and just, you know, kind of leaking out for an easy little safety valve. Some of that stuff, as you start to get against some, like we're going to see some really good rushers coming up. Kansas State, they've got a beast that's going to be coming off the edge. Um, You know, so like whenever that happens, you're going to see those tight ends lining up and motioning across, chipping off, and then releasing down the field. Yeah. Okay, a little more on the O-line. Uh, we we kind of talked about the issues that were there in the first half. Uh, did do some much better stuff in the second half. Thought Anton Harrison looked much more comfortable at left tackle. I thought that was a smart decision by Bill Bedenbo to to flip those two tackles. And it's funny because Tyler Guy looked better at right tackle than he did <laughs> yeah. at left. Yeah. It, it was pretty interesting. I thought both guys, you know, and – with Anton, I I probably am just I and I'm not saying I'm giving up on the guy, but like I want to see him finish blocks. I want to see a little more nasty to him, but I I think I may just have to accept that that's not him, right? That maybe he's not now. He you know does his job, goes to the next snap, but I, I did think overall he played pretty well. Uh, McCade Matar he. He looked much better than he did in the first game. <laughs> he looked much better. He looked definitely looked healthier, but there's just too many times with him where, I mean, he's basically just standing straight up and dancing with the guy at the line of scrimmage in the run game. Like there's no movement. There's no pop. It's, I don't know. I, I once again, I, I do, I still don't think that guy's a hundred percent, but He's got to, he's got to get his pads down. He's got to play with more leverage. Like there's a lot, like, it's just, it's got to be better. I, he is, he is generating very little movement yeah. right now. So I, well, a lot of that is like, whatever you're saying it, at times they're unsure, like what back their con or back or their combo went up to. And I, a lot of that it's, I don't know. I'm just thinking of it defensively. I, you don't typically get super aggressive until you know where you're supposed to be. And like, right. whenever you know where you're supposed to be, you end up playing really aggressive and really fast. Like if you're sitting there thinking at the line of scrimmage and I'm not even sure if this is the guy I'm supposed to be blocking, it's hard to really fire off into him. But you know, I, I don't know. Maybe there's some in like, if you, if you talk about some injury or some not injury, but, banged up and throw a little you know confusion in there as well it's not a good it's not a good recipe yeah um know what linebacker you're working to solid advice in the run game it, it's solid advice in general. also if you're working to a linebacker in protection he might add to the rush late keep your eyes where they're supposed to be because there's a couple times that's that's where the sacks are coming from right? Like they're looking at their backer. Okay. He's sitting there eyes off him. He adds to the rush unblocked. And I'm just, 
about to throw my phone, you know, at the wedding cake at the ceremony. I'm so just explain it to me. Um, you're the center. I'm the left guard. We're jogging up to the line of scrimmage. We know we're 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 zoning to the left, right? Like, what's the like? Where's the breakdown? Is there? Are they not talking? There I should don't be a ton know. Of, because be a ton of chatter, right? Like, yeah, yeah the communication. I, if that's the issue, like that's just dumb. You don't need to keep secrets, right? Like you, you need to know where you're going, especially if there's motion involved, like the picture's going to change, but you should also in your preparation, you should know that with the play call. So I, I don't know, man, I, I'm a little confused because you look at those first two series of the game. I mean, two out of your first, the, the first play of the game was just a horrible outside zone. It was ugly, Ugh. but then your second play of the game, you've got an unblocked linebacker that bumps in the box because of motion. And then on the second series, second play, so they, they go empty and they throw a nice ball to Marvin. The second play of the, of, so the first and 10 after that play on the second series, unblocked linebacker making the play. Yeah. It, it's just, I, I don't know how that happens. Well, it, I mean, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter. You should be able to say, Hey, we're comboing up to that guy right there. I, it doesn't matter. You think the defense is like, they don't know what you're, I mean, what you're talking about 90% of the time, even if they do, they still have to play through like their keys and everything. And so I, it, it would I guess be my I just preference how I, I just, I guess I don't know. If you're going to be wrong, where it should, you should both at least be on the same page and be wrong together. I guess is what I'm saying, right? I, I would, I would over communicate until you start blocking the right guys all the time. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. That that's that's the approach I would take. Now, Andrew Rame, he is he he does play with good physicality. I I don't know how many times I'll say this, but I'm going to keep saying it. I've I'm not sure I've ever seen an offensive lineman push people away from him the way that he does. He, it, yeah. it makes his life so much harder. I don't know. Just grab people and don't let them go. Get called. Please just get called for holding. I just want to see him get called for holding once. <laughs> like, just grab a guy. Uh, it's just, it would save. Uh, well, other than that, like, he's. You got to get everyone on the same page. That's your job as a center, but he he's got to play better. He's just, he got to play better. Yeah. And it's just where we're at. Chris Murray. He's, I mean, you know what you're getting from Chris, right? He's, he's been pretty consistent. And then I thought Guyton, he looked more under control at right tackle. Um, did a much better job of not getting pulled by defensive linemen. Uh, like we talked about against UTEP. Uh, but the, the good thing about Guyton for me, and I'm not sure if it was the position switch or what, but it, I saw improvement from what I saw from him last week and what I saw from him this week. And when you're talking about a, when you're talking about a guy that hasn't played a ton at that position, right? He just hasn't played a ton of snaps of college football, especially along the offensive line, seeing improvement from a young player like that between game one and game two, that's, that's really encouraging. I liked it. Yeah. You still see flashes of him. Like whenever he's, he knows where he's going. He's, he's confident and he, you can see that athleticism. He moves really, really well. One random thing I'd like to point out. Best block of the night goes to Aaron parks. And the unfortunate part for him is he's probably going to get a double minus on the play because he goes the wrong way. <laughs> they're running outside zone in the fourth quarter. They're running it to the left. He goes to the right, bumps off Savion bird, realizes he's made a huge mistake. I'm going the wrong way. Just takes off running, goes the right direction and takes a linebacker and puts him into the bench. Nice. <laughs> the best block of the night. <laughs> and he's probably, he's probably going to get a double minus for a mental error. Which is, uh, I mean, but I, I, it jumped off the tape to me. I was like, hmm, I, I like that. I'd prefer you go the right way to start with, but 
Just thought I'd point that out. Well, what'd you think of Savion Bird? He got some he got some left guard reps right in the fourth quarter there when they still had the first unit in. And it, he really just didn't I, – I was watching it closely, right? He really just didn't have to do much. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, he clearly has tools, right? You can see the athleticism. You can see the length, the strength. But, man, I – he he just must not practice very well. That's got to be it, right? See, that's so strange to me. I mean, I, I, I think you you have to be right. I, he he's got to be messing things up in practice, because, you know, whenever I was I was going and watching training camp, everyone kept saying that guy is he's gonna he's gonna be a stud. He's like. So, I don't know. It, it it just seems strange that when everyone is saying the same thing, that he's like not practicing well. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't. It's not matching up, and it's this, it's why I'm so. I feel like when Wanya Morris comes back, which Venable said that he, they hope to have him back this week against Nebraska, I I feel like something like the whole thing has to click better because everyone was telling me that it's the strength of the team. And right now it looks like the weakness of the team. Uh, we had, we had that conversation on here and I took the, I took the stance of I'm a, I'm going to just sit and wait and see. Yeah. You know, which it, we can be honest. It hadn't been good. It hadn't been, it certainly hadn't been where you want it to be right. in the first two games. But if they want to, I mean, if they want to win this conference, the old line's got to start playing better. I mean, it's just bottom line. But there's no doubt. That's why, I mean, I'm not panicking yet, but I I feel like the offensive line we've marched out the last two weeks, I, 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 I feel like that is a disaster waiting to happen against Kansas State. Did you see what they did in Missouri? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, uh... They're good this year. They are they – are, they're going to be tough, both sides of the ball. Yeah. So, it was – yeah, it's going to be – it's going to be interesting, but if there's one thing Beanbow's done a good job of, he typically – no, he typically that that unit typically gets better as the season progresses, right? No doubt. So let me ask you this. Oh boy. Wanye Morris back. And he's at right tackle. Is there a chance we see Guyton at a guard? I I am always I'll tell you this. Tyler Guyton's one of the best five they've got. With what we've seen in the first two games, he's one of the best five they've got. So, how how do you make it work? Whether he stays there and Wanya Morris plays a tackle, or or he plays a guard. Now, like you you, you look at out. the two body types between Wanya and and Guyton. Wanya is probably the one you're bumping in, right? That's a I mean he's he's a thicker dude than Guyton, but I I don't know. Yeah, that's. You you have you have to get better play from the center position and the left guard position. You do so whatever whatever combination you want to throw out there and feel good about it. Like I I guarantee you this, Bill try whatever he's got to try yeah. to get this group playing at the level he wants wants them playing at. And right now they're just not at that level. They're not. Yeah. But we got only time. played two games. Got time. Yeah. But we'll we'll see. Okay, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys your biggest takeaway from OU's win over Kent State. Uh, this one comes from Casey Moody, who says major is RB one. I feel like that is. I feel like that's going to be consensus. Um. Like I said, to me, I really don't care 
at the end of the day, we're going to need both of those guys playing at a very, very high level. And I think you have that right now. So I, my eyes tell me that he's the better, he's better running the football right now than Eric Gray is. So however you want to phrase that, He's RB1, fine, don't know, but I like what we've got in our, our number one and number two guys. And frankly, I like what we've got in our number three and our number four guys as well. Yeah. Okay, this I, other I, one if, comes. If Just one thing to add. I, I hope You never wanted to come to this, but I, I feel that we would be in a really good spot even if some – something bad happened and we lost one of those two guys that I would consider both of them a starter, right? Is right. The way they're rotating through. I, I think with uh Tawi Walker or Javante Barnes that you're going to end up being really good there. Yeah. Okay. This is, this other one comes from Chris Nelson who says zero turnovers, zero personal fouls. Yeah. That that's, you know, we, uh, we we just went through offensive defense and they did win 33 to three. I know it wasn't 50 to nothing like everyone wanted it to be. I understand that, but I, I we I I think we're just kind of we got the bigger picture in mind, right? You know, kind of where we want to see this team get to uh by by the season's end. But yeah, it's it is it's important to point out the positives as well yeah zero turnovers zero personal fouls uh not seeing the team make a bunch of dumb you know after the play mistakes like i that is that's thanks chris nelson for bringing that that that's some positivity right there i i will say that i feel like i even though everything has not been perfect i do feel like this team mentally physically they're in a really good place i think they execute i think they're dialed in on details now not all of those details are perfect but i'm talking more of i'm talking more like just kind of the overall flow and the way things are supposed to be handled on game day like though like this team is locked in and focused. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Okay. One last thing. And then we'll move on the led lights. Thumbs up, thumbs down. What'd you think? Thumbs up. Liked it. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. It was great. I think there was still, at least with me, um, a bit of fear that they weren't going to click back on like they were supposed to whenever the light show was over. But it happened every time they came back on as they were needed. It was awesome. It was really cool. They did a couple of different things like uh, music wise uh, with the with the lights every time out. It was it was a party. It was cool. Yeah. So it added to the atmosphere big time. Seemed like it got, you know, a lot of positive reviews. All right. Birthday shout outs. Happy fifth birthday to Colt Whitson. Happy sixth birthday to Juliet Hatton. Happy seventh birthday to Jillian Bolt. Happy ninth birthday to Knox Dillsaber. Happy 14th birthday to Tanner and Tessa Iverson. Happy 14th birthday to Christian Wood. Happy 15th birthday to Janie Ford. Happy 16th birthday to Kinley Donahue. I think that's right. I think you nailed it. Okay. Happy 29th birthday to Austin McGinnis. Happy 31st birthday to Justine Jilane. I think you nailed that one too. Not sure. Never Jelaine. seen that last name. Justine Jelaine. Happy 50th birthday to Steve Hennen Hennergart. Hennergart. Happy 56th birthday to Kim Slay. Happy birthday to Renee Hurd. Happy birthday to Susan Chandler. Happy birthday to Craig Lubin. Happy ninth anniversary to Davey and Joy Phillips. 
Happy 30th anniversary to Steve and Alicia Hennergart. And happy anniversary to Richard and Liz. Whew. Man, we, we, yes, we, we had some stockpiled, <laughs> apparently. Jeez. All right. Let's get to the National College Football Roundup. It was an awesome weekend in college football. But first, the only place to stop when you're road tripping is at Love's Travel Stops. Luz has over 600 locations in 41 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Love's has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Amore. That coffee is fantastic. Love's also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile-to-go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Loves Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Loves Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Loves Travel Stops. For a full list of what Loves has to offer, visit loves.com. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, Go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. Gabe, I got to tell you, I've over the last two weeks at home games, I've probably had 200 people tell me buttery soft and 10% off yes. and, uh, and show their clothes. Yes, awesome. it's working. It's working. <laughs> Make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. With a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio, no student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. All right, National College Football Roundup. Number one, Alabama escapes. Austin, Texas with a 20 to 19 win. And said, unless my eyes lied to me, Texas was a better football team for three quarters. Uh, they they, they look good, man. I, and I know there's no moral victories, right? If you're Texas, but they, that team has to feel much better about themselves than they felt going into the game, right? It's just, it's gotta be how that they went toe to toe with what everyone thinks is the best team in the country and probably should have won the game. Should have won the game. Yep. They should have. They should have. I, I, I can't believe I'm saying it, but they had every opportunity to win that game. They did get screwed on a call that should have been a safety. Do you um, think his shin was down? Um. I I didn't think his shin was down, but I didn't think it was roughing the passer, and he it was intentional grounding in the end zone. So it should have been a safety. Um, terrible call, but they had it, other opportunities to win the game. Biggest shock for me: how good their offensive line handled Alabama's defensive line, and how good their defensive line did against Alabama's offensive line. I, I thought those were going to be the two biggest mismatches on the field. And quite frankly, they it was either a stalemate or they won the, both of those battles. Yeah, I they they couldn't get much going in the run game, right? If they would have been able to get B. John Robinson going a little more in the run game, maybe that's what, what ultimately would have won them this football game. But yeah, that, I, I'll just say it. Texas defense looked awesome. They looked great. They, yep. they looked really, really good. Physical at the line of scrimmage. Man, some of the – they had safeties coming downhill, laying dudes. I, I was I was thoroughly impressed. And 
poor Pete Kwiatkowski gets no credit. Everyone's just saying it's all Gary Patterson. Like yeah, he guy- had to tweet it out. You know, it's like, and, and instead of just saying nothing, it draws more attention to it whenever you say hey you know i'm just here doing my part people you know everyone's a team effort all that stuff we not me he's he's basking in it right now gary patterson is yeah but bryce young you know team needed him to step up last drive of the game go win the game is exactly what he did yeah i mean a a heisman trophy type drive their little houdini act i'm sure ryan watts the guy that missed him for texas will be thinking about that one for a long time but i thought here we go again alabama kickers all right what's gonna happen here but he he drilled it and and we haven't even talked about the quinn ewers part of it i mean because it hudson card and hudson card was banged up too i mean he was limping around i mean he looked awful like everyone's but, making a lot of like Quinn Ewers. I thought Hudson Carr played really good. He he was fine, but just some of the throws. I, we I, I would say we have we have approached the Quinn Ewers situation skeptically, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, we haven't seen this guy play much football. Let's before we start giving him a bunch of praise, let's see him. He was great when he was in, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, he so he was pushing it down the field to Xavier Worthy, but like he looked good. I mean, Texas defense looked good. Quinn Ewers looked good, and it was. And I was just watching. I just wanted to be entertained. I was, I was bummed when he got hurt, man. Like I you knew good. it was that AC joint right when it happened, and it was just, it was such a bummer because, I just wanted to see him play the entire football game against Pimp, like. Who knows if the game goes differently? Maybe he makes some critical mistakes. We'll never know. But him going out with injury, that's suck. Yeah. I think he'll be back. You know, and, and maybe it's different, but I saw the update said it was his SC joint. Oh, okay. Where, gotcha. It's where it connects right here. And I've dislocated that before. And it's not nearly as bad as the AC joint. Okay. Because, like, the AC joint is – it it moves a little bit more and it's obviously exposed more. This one right here doesn't move as much, but you know, I don't know how it, like throwing the football, it obviously probably doesn't feel uh, great, but I think, uh, you know, they said four to six. I bet he'll, he's back quicker than that. Yeah. I guarantee you, he'll be back for OU Texas. We all oh, know yeah. that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause that's how it always works. Yeah. But the, and Bama won the game. Right, you go on the road. Sounded like it was a very hostile environment it there was. in Austin. Give it up to to UT. They showed up. This is this is the most Texas compliments we have ever passed out on this podcast. I can't believe what's happening right now. But Bama just—it was so weird seeing them look so undisciplined. I know it was bizarre. Fifteen penalties, and some of them were really, really dumb. Like even Will Anderson, just. I just lost his mind. It's like, it was really weird seeing them play undisciplined, undisciplined football like that. And then Texas, man, they they had to be watching that tape on Sunday going, man, how many missed opportunities? I mean, because what? They missed a 20-yard field goal. How many times did they settle for field goals? What, three times? Mm -hmm. They're settling for field goals there, you know, deep in the red zone. Xavier Worthy dropped a touchdown and dropped an interception. Like they, they, I know that's what it could have should have stuff, but like they, sh- they should have won that game. They, they looked like the, they looked like the better football team for the majority of the game. I was convinced for most of the game that they were going to win it. And I thought that they were going to at one point start to separate, but here's the thing I will say though. We have seen a bunch of times where Texas plays up to their opponent and does so well. The problem for them is they're about to play a damn good UTSA football team. And the Texas I know from the past is going to be patting each other on the back, talking about how good they are, 
and how they finally arrived and UTSA is not even worth their attention. They're already looking down the road for the big games and someone like that will jump up and bite them. Like if they really want to get my attention, they follow up that performance and go out and, and stomp on a, a, what is a really good UTSA football team. Yeah, we'll see. All right, let's move on to our next game. Tennessee went to Pitt and got an overtime win. And if you watch this game, both teams tried to give this thing away. My goodness. I mean, now Pitt was, I mean, they were controlling things early. Like it looked like it was going to get out of hand Mm -hmm. early in that football game. And then Keaton Slovis, that, that interception in the end zone kind of changed the entire trajectory of that game because instead of it being 17-0 or 13-0, uh, Tennessee gets that, that interception in the end zone and then goes down the field and scores uh, to make it 10-7. And the game was kind of on from that point on. Uh, Slovis going out with what I, everyone's assuming was a concussion in the second quarter clearly uh, was had a huge impact on the game, but I, I thought Hendon hooker was, it's pretty dang good in this game. Um, now when he needed to make big plays and the biggest plays of the game he made were, were to Cedric Tillman. I, I thought that when, when they needed him to make big throws, he, he did some really good things, but Teddy, you, you love special teams. I would say you are passionate. Mm-hmm. about special teams and special teams were an absolute dumpster fire in this football game in this football. How about for the entire weekend college and professional, it was a dumpster fire except for some things are as they always are. Kansas state had a punt return for a touchdown shock. Yeah. Shocking. But yeah, Tennessee had a punt blocked. Uh, they muffed a punt that, Pitt recovered uh, Pitt's kicker missed two field goals. So it was just, it was quite the disaster. And then the backup quarterback for Pitt, Nick Patty, he, I mean, did a good job, you know, leads them on the drive to go tie the game, but then just takes a massive sack in overtime. And it was just, it, it was a, it was a nice win for Tennessee. I, I don't know how good their defense is, I thought they would score some more points or yep. I th- maybe I thought they would get off to a faster start in this game, but ultimately, and Hypo talked about it after the game, like this is a, this isn't a game that Tennessee wins the last couple of years, last that's couple of years. I was about to say that's the, they find a way to lose that one last couple of years. Yeah. So the fact that the game started the way it did, they were able to kind of settle in and then it kind of looked like Tennessee may run away with it. And, it, it was a it was a fun back and forth football game, but ultimately you go get a top twenty five win on the road, pretty pretty big win for for Hypo. I mean, it's not, yeah. Not only do you pull off a win, top twenty five win on the road, cover. Yeah, <laughs> cover the went, number what was it six and a half? Six and a half. When it went to overtime, I said we got a chance, baby. We still got a chance. Yeah. Oh man, unbelievable. Yeah, best play of that game, though. Did you see that pit tied in, hurdle that guy and run for that touchdown? That was I did. awesome. I did. That that was great. I I felt bad. You could, like, see people laughing in the background before the play was even over. So I always feel for the defensive guy in that situation, but um, that was awesome. It That's one of the most perfectly timed hurdles I think I've ever seen because – he like, he didn't really even have the height to go over the guy. It was just so perfectly timed that it worked It worked amazingly. Uh, I'm sure that's going to be an awesome picture for <laughs> yeah. that guy to hang oh, on yeah. his wall. I mean, that's going to be sweet. Okay, last game. And a game that n- did not go the way that we thought it would. Uh, no. Baylor goes to BYU and loses in double overtime, 26 to 20. The the first half, if you watched it, it was a it was a good old defensive battle, dude. There were some pads popping in that game. My goodness, yeah. And I, 
you got to give a lot of credit to BYU's defense. Yes. Yep. I I thought they did a really good job uh, of slowing down Baylor's run game. Longest run for Baylor, 13 yards. I mean, and BYU, they just did a really good job of limiting big plays. Longest pass was like 19 yards. And Baylor, you know, I, I thought that the big play was going to be a much bigger piece of their offense this year. And it was in the opener, but once again, you know, they weren't playing anybody. Blake Shapin didn't connect on any of those big passes in the vertical passing game right yeah. off, you know, the play action stuff. It, I, I thought that they would have quite a few of those and they didn't. I thought the BYU drive before halftime was big, right? To go score the touchdown there. Um, that, that was impressive stuff. And Jaron Hall, he wasn't perfect for BYU, man, but he did some good things. He did, he did some really good things. He did. Um, I, I thought Shapin, you know, I thought he did a good job. He was more athletic than I thought. Yeah, he um, moves around well. He moves around really well. And uh, I, I was surprised that he was pressured as much as he was and pushed off the spot as much as he was. Um, I thought Baylor's offensive line was going to hold up better. And you're right, credit BYU's defense. Because Baylor, they kept hitting those runs. And their two backs are just like Abram Smith was last year. They are big, they are physical, and they come downhill. I just kept waiting for one of those to, you know, instead of being the six, seven, eight-yard gainer, that they would bust it loose and get out into the open and turn it into some big explosive plays. But they just could never break away and, and cause that big game-changing uh, type of play. So that was, that was a great game, though. Uh, g really good atmosphere. What the hell are those things that they all pass around and eat after one another? In the I don't stands? know. We need to get uh, like, what was that? Is it like, it's like a cookie or like it's called a cougar tail, but they like just hand them around and everyone bites off the same thing. It's crazy. Can't be sanitary. No, of course not. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I saw that. I was like, BYU, they're just kind of weird, man. You know? Hey, I got to tell you, and I hate to admit this, I, 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 I could not physically keep my eyes open anymore after the first overtime. Oh, just, you fell asleep before I, it I just, ended? I, I didn't even fall asleep. I just like, it was, I was like in physical pain trying to stay awake. I just turned it off. I did BYU score first in the second overtime. Well, so remember, no, remember, yes, yes. I think whatever they scored, I, I like turned it off. I was like, okay, Baylor's not going to be able to get it done. Yeah, well, Baylor, they got it down to like the three or four and then had a couple of false starts that pushed them back. Oh. And yeah. The, the things did open up in the second half a little bit in that game. Um, it, it, was, it was a fun game to watch. But this, the end of this game and overtime, it's a great reminder. Never leave it up to the kicker. <laughs> what right. old Royd or whatever his name was misses to win it in regulation for BYU. Both kickers miss in the first overtime. Never leave it up to the kicker. That we, we talked about Alabama having a bunch of penalties. I mean, Baylor, 14 penalties. Well, I mean, and what's his name got tossed Doyle and yeah. that hurt them. It, God, that's, that's such a bad call to me. I just, I could never accept that that's targeting and that he should be kicked out of a football game for that play. I just, I, it's just not right in my opinion, but whatever. it's just a, it's a really, it's a really severe punishment, you know? Yep. But on, uh, on a play, that's not, a malicious play it's just a football play like i understand if you peel back on a guy and just go decleat someone i understand if a wide receiver the ball's overthrown and the safety just comes over and just destroys a defenseless guy i i get that but uh, in a in a football play it's such a severe penalty i hate it yeah no i'm with you but i will say Kind of disappointed in that loss for Baylor. And it's oh, not yeah. just because I, you know, picked him to win the game, but 
BYU didn't have their best two wide receivers. I just, it, it's the type of, it's the type of game. Like if you want to be considered, you know, a top 10, top 15 type program consistently, like got to win some games like that. And I, I, I felt like they let one get away. No doubt. Totally agree. And Baylor's kind of had a problem with that recently that they've, they've lost some games that, and this isn't necessarily a head scratcher. I mean, that's a top 25 team on the road. BYU's a, a tough football team, but they've lost some games where it's like, now, hang on. I thought you guys were past this kind of, this kind of stage, but you know what? That's college football. I, yeah. You know, college football, that's just the, the nature of college football. Yep. All right. Let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, it's football time in Oklahoma, people. There's nothing better to drink at the tailgate than Clubby Seltzers. Clubby Seltzers is an Oklahoma company that's already winning national awards because their product is delicious. Tastes exactly like a club special, but it's a seltzer. They're not just for tailgating either. They're perfect to drink on the golf course, by the pool, after mowing the lawn, whatever. If you haven't tried Clubby Seltzers yet, go grab some. You won't regret it. The variety pack is out. They got some new flavors, a new can. To find a place near you that has Clubby's, visit clubbyseltzers.com. And attention, business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices, th offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. Are you looking to buy or sell a house in the OKC metro area? Use the Ronaldo Cloud Group. Stacia Ronaldo and Maddie Cloud are with Sage Sotheby's International Realty. They believe in prompt communication, an honest relationship, and luxury service. And that's exactly what they gave Gabe. They sold a house for Gabe. They found a house for Gabe's brother. And they also found a house for Lane Johnson. We can't recommend them enough. You can reach them by calling or texting Stacia at 918-671-6450. Or you can contact them on Instagram at, at soldbystacia and at soldbymaddie underscore. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Well, I've thought long and hard, Gabe, about going with the student section. Now, I know you weren't there. Student section was packed. Like yes. 30 minutes before kick, maybe even longer, 45 minutes before kick. They were there. They were loud. It was packed all the way up until halftime. It was packed through halftime. It was packed to start the third quarter. It was packed all the way through the third quarter whenever we had that big run-up, secured the game. And then it was packed through the third and fourth quarter when they turned the lights out and did the uh, like the, the dance and the th in between the third and fourth quarter, all that. And then it was packed through the fourth quarter. And it was packed for the fourth quarter all the way until the clock hit zero. They never left. It was awesome. It makes me so happy. Yeah. And it makes yeah. me even I'm really, I miss one game and it's a game where the student section just balls out. What? The student section was the most packed section, the entire game. Well, you know, the whole stadium was packed for, you know, the first three quarters, but as people started to leave after the third quarter, student section was packed all the way till the clock hit double zeros. Hell yeah. So you students, that's how it's done. Very proud of you guys. Way to go. Good work. But I guess I had to uh, settle on the fun belt, right? <laughs> and uh, App State, man, you know, every now and then 
a team comes along and just accomplishes what every single person in the country wants them to do. And knocking off Texas A&M was that exact thing. Amazing. I didn't get to watch much of it, but as I saw the updates coming in, I just pure joy, Gabe, just pure joy. This is what you, this is college football, right? This is it. I, I did get to watch quite a bit of it. Texas A&M's offense stinks. It's terrible. Like I, I don't know how you have that much talent and you're that bad on offense. What they run like 30 something plays for the entire game. They had nine first downs the entire game. <laughs> uh, Haynes King ain't it Jimbo. Uh, they got that five-star kid. They might as well go to him. Season's over. There's no coming back from losing to half state. No, there's not. And I, I will you, say this. If, and if anyone didn't get to watch this game, App State was the better team. There, there was nothing fluky about this at all. They outplayed them in every phase of the game, which I, I was watching it going because you know the type of talent a has got, right? And you're, it, was, it was stunning. Man, pretty satisfying, I won't lie. But it was, it was, it was pretty wild watching them get outplayed completely throughout that game it was i couldn't take my eyes off it yeah uh you know i just i i'm i'm not a big fan of jimbo's that's okay you know i'm I, he's got plenty of fans um but you know it just takes one loss to a team like appalachian state where you know all of a sudden you know because because Anyone that says anything bad about Jimbo gets overrun by just the sheer volume of Texas A&M fans that are out there, which is fine. That's good. I'm glad that they're, they're behind their team, but like the cat is out of the bag. Like Jimbo Fisher's aside from a two year run, he's an eight and four football coach. And that's what A&M's been since he's been there. That's what they appear to be again this year and his offenses are not good so they they aren't i mean certainly one one good with what i watched on saturday okay. and the if they if that's them they'll be lucky to be eight and four with the schedule they've got right so well, and i'm anxious to see like their defense couldn't get off the field how how do they how do they respond to like cuz cuz not all teams re respond to something like this the same way and whenever you like the NIL in combination with the transfer portal situation becomes really interesting whenever a team you know and they've got a lot of football to play but if you have like a a shockingly disappointing season to what a lot of people thought you were going to do. Like, what does that, what does that mean for your roster at the end of the season? Yeah. Well, all I know is Appalachian state had the ball for 41 minutes and 29 seconds of that football game. <laughs> 12, 12 of 25 on third and fourth down conversions. All right. Almost all 50% for Appalachian state. I mean, it was – they beat him up, man. I, it was – and it's not like Chase Bryce is some you know, all-world QB back there for him. It was – it was impressive. I mean, Appalachian State – anyone that watched that game walked away going, oh, no, no, yeah, that better team won, no doubt. Can you imagine – I, I'm sure they had, you know, 85 plus 90, 100,000 people in that stadium. Can you imagine the moans and the groans like when the defense can't get off the field and finally, oh my God, finally they get off the field and you three and out or I mean, that had to be its own hostile environment to play in as that game wore on. Oh my gosh. I can only imagine. <laughs> and another dreadful field goal attempt. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Texas a and lost. Uh, clearly, we're we're very upset about it. <laughs> All right. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Uh, he's not the loser of the weekend, but I thought Baker Mayfield had pulled it off. I thought he pulled it off. And then the Browns go down and who, who is this kicker that hits a 58 yard bomb into the top of the net? That would have been good for like 70 plus yards. I, I hated that for Baker. I thought he had gone down and won the football game after, you know, really grinding it out. His poor rookie left tackle trying to block Miles Garrett was, you know, that was tough, tough on Baker and you know, can you imagine after the couple of sacks that, that Garrett had knowing that your, your left tackle is whiffing on that guy every time. And how can you even have any poise in the pocket at all to l- deliver a football? That was frustrating to watch. I hated that for him. Yeah, it, it was watching him take him on that drive was fun as hell though. Oh, I know it was great. It, especially it. I think it, it said a lot about Baker. He did. He did not play particularly well early, right? Right. But turned it on when they uh, when they needed him, and he. I mean, you could just feel that football team kind of feeding off that energy. I, that was an absolute bomb by the York kid, guy. What, rookie, that moment. He murdered that me? football. Murdered it. He. He robbed us of an awesome post-game press conference from Baker. I know. I'm kind of upset at him. Like, great. Good for you. You did your job. You kicked the absolute hell out of that football. This is why they drafted you so early. I get it. But he robbed us of some great content. I know. Which, content-wise, the NFL at 330 is the greatest thing in history. Is it not? It's. It's like, I, you can't even explain it. What, whatever happened, the comedy of errors that went on in the Cincinnati Steelers game was just, I, I couldn't even, <laughs> I turned it. I, I told my, my wife and her mom, they're all Steelers fans. I told them they lost last play of the game. Brutal. Turned it off. I was, I was done with it. And then I flipped back over and they're in overtime. I was like, what, what happened? <laughs> amazing oh it's classic yeah i'll touch on that a little bit (laughs) all right i'll give you my winner and loser but first first fidelity bank is a full service financial institution based in oklahoma tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs checking accounts saving accounts home loans and much more they do it all whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone Everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you are doing. Head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. You got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcones Pot Still Bourbon. It's big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year-round. Remember, in 2012, Balcones Single Malt won the Best in Glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit balconiesdistilling.com. All right, for my winner of the weekend, thought about going with Mark Stoops in Kentucky. I I guess we, we've got to take Anthony Richardson's week one Heisman away from him. <laughs> he struggled, man. He struggled. 
Um, but Kentucky goes to the swamp, gets a 26, 16 win over Florida. And that defense from Kentucky is, that is a physical group, man. And, and they, they completely contained Anthony Richardson had the pick six, uh, got multiple fourth down stops in the fourth quarter when they absolutely had to have them just really impressive stuff. And Mark Stoops becomes the all time winningest head coach in Kentucky football history. It's crazy. pretty solid weekend for the Wildcats. What was, uh, what was Florida ranked? They went all the way up to 12, I think. Right. Think about that. Kentucky Mark Stoops overtakes bear bryant as the winningest coach in kentucky football history with the win over number 12 florida on the road like to think about that in kentucky football is crazy yeah no i'm with you really 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 nice win also thought about going you mentioned the pittsburgh steelers but at beat the cincinnati Bengals in overtime and if you haven't seen the end of that football game Go watch it. I mean, it is just, it was a wild ride. The fourth yeah. quarter into overtime, Ted, a lot, a lot happened. I Here's the only problem. The end of that football game lasts an hour and a half. Correct. <laughs> it took a very, very long time. But so the, you mentioned turning it off, right? Joe Burrow gets another opportunity. And by the way, that dude was turning the ball over like crazy. Yeah. Would they have five turnovers? He had five. Yeah, he had five, including a pick six. So he had he had four four interceptions. One was a pick six, and had a lost fumble. And I will say, everyone, they loaded up right on O line and free agency. He still got hit like a million times. He got killed. T.J. Watt was incredible. Then he tore his pec. Oh, Joe Mixon and Samaj P. Ryan were all over the place. Both those guys had nice games, but I. I think this is when you turn it off. The Bengals score, right? They go down. Yeah. They score. Jamar Chase, out route, corner of the end zone. It's a phenomenal football player. Which, did you see the one where his toe was barely out, the one-handed catch? Yes. I jumped up. I'm, I'm, I was alone at my house and jumped up in the living room. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> what a catch. I, I did the that. same thing. I was watching it alone <laughs> in Colorado. Did the exact same thing. That's hilarious. But. So they score, right? And this is just kind of how the end of this game was. The, the Bengals long snapper got hurt. So their a backup tight end had to snap the extra point. The operation was really slow. Like it was on target, but it was slow. And me and Fitzpatrick just like, he almost like caught it in the air. <laughs> he was there so quickly. It was, so that's how it ended up going into overtime. And then overtime, well, Boswell doinks one, and then it gets another they chance. They both then, missed, why? Didn't they yeah. both miss in overtime? It was, I mean, it was just, the NFL is incredible. And for that, to, for us to get that in week one was just, oh, so good. It's the funniest thing is like, he kicks the game winner. It's such a weird thing, though, because on the sideline, it's like, we either win if he loses, we tie because overtime was about to be, it was such it's, it's a weird game. <laughs> yeah. But my winner of the weekend, Lance Leipold, mm. because the Kansas Jayhawks went to Morgantown and beat West Virginia and got it done in overtime. And Kansas is two and zero for the first time since 2011. And the thing about that game was they went down early. Like West Virginia's offense looked great to start the game, moving it at will. And Kansas kind of just weathered the storm and then yep. took the game completely over. And, and West Virginia had to mount a comeback in the fourth quarter. Yeah. I, you know, I, I talked about it a little bit after week one, when they had that Im impressive win uh, against Tennessee tech, I, they look good on defense at the big 12 player of the week on defense. Uh, I'm not saying that they're going to run through the big 12. I don't even know like what their final record is going to be, but that team is moving in the right direction. Uh, number one offense in the country points per game right now, the Kansas Jayhawks. 
How about that? Yeah, and Jalen Daniels is the reason why. That guy's fun to watch, man. Yep. Did it with his arm, did it with his legs. I mean, he was he was the difference maker in that game for them. And <laughs> the the most the most bizarre thing about this game wasn't Kansas coming back, uh, wasn't West Virginia putting some drives together in the fourth quarter to force overtime. Kansas ends up winning by 12 points in an overtime game. <laughs> no. Because, you know, they score. And then during the, you know, JT Daniels gets the ball, throws a pick six that gets returned. I didn't look at the wow. over under or anything like that, but it'd be hilarious if that had an effect on it. Oh, that would be the craziest. That, that'd be the craziest bad beat ever, or however you want to look at it, or best win ever but yeah hey man hats off to lipo that contract extension you can tell something's different up there and that we've been we've talked about daniels for a while if they could just give him some time he can make you pay uh he's a good player right now kansas is running the football for 250 yards a game devin neal had a nice game yep He's he's a solid back, and then what Daniels brings is a runner. He was their leading rusher in that one. So, yeah, but it's just Kansas is a competent program again. It's good, yeah, and that that is not a good loss for our boy Neil Brown, man. Mm. No, that is no. And I guess I didn't see the game, but you know there was some week one clock issues clock management stuff and like going for it and those type of things and i guess some of that happened again in this game is that right yeah a little bit so it's, referencing it so yeah so i don't know not good but all right let's get to my loser of the weekend thought about going with marcus freeman the honeymoon is over yeah yikes after after giving notre dame fans a lot to be excited about with how they played against Ohio state last week. You go and you lose the home opener to Marshall mm. and Notre Dame's offense. It just, they, they have not found much offensively. We thought it was Ohio state played really, really good defense last week. Uh, yeah. Marshall shut him down too. I mean, they couldn't run the ball. Uh, Buckner, now he got banged up, but he was okay. He doesn't look like a big difference maker. How does Notre Dame not have an awesome quarterback? I don't understand it. They haven't had an awesome quarterback in a really, really long time. They are like Iowa. When's the last awesome quarterback that they had? I mean, Ian Book was okay, but no. He, like, Shouldn't Notre Dame have – one of the best quarterbacks in college football, like you can be the quarterback at Notre Dame. I feel like a lot comes with that. Yeah. Why? Do, I, how do they not have a good quarterback, man? I don't know. I don't know. It, they bring Drew Pine in and he was oh, not good. Yeah. So, I mean, just a very, very disappointing loss for Marcus Freeman. That, like you lose the bowl game, you lose to Ohio State. That's one thing. You got to beat Marshall, man. You got to beat Marshall. Um, it's tough. Here's the thing. I, I am not, I do not waver from my opinion that he was a great hire for Notre Dame at head coach. Agreed. I, you know, he's on the verge of, he was already on the verge of losing that really good recruiting class that they had. You know, they started off with like, I don't know, three or four or five stars. They've already lost a couple of them in decommits. They had one more guy, um, the safety there out of North Texas, that is still committed to him. Like, this isn't going to help that situation. A lot of people think that he's he's not going to go there either. Like, there's, there's going to be some tough times. It's not all going to be just positive all the way through, but I still think it's a good hire. But they've got to – they've. it's been too long for them to not to not be up at the top offensively like everyone else that's been in the into the playoff multiple times has had at least some type of explosive offense one year or another and 
just hadn't happened for Notre Dame yet. Yeah, and it also it hadn't happened for Iowa. No. Thought about going with them. The streak is over. Matt Campbell beat Iowa. It's crazy. Ten to seven in <laughs> Iowa City. It it was it was a horrible game to watch. I mean, horrible. I I've got the numbers here. Iowa, one hundred and sixty six total yards. Four of 17 on third down, 57 yards rushing. Uh, credit to Iowa State. They got it. They, they slayed the dragon. The good news here is that the Jackrabbits of, was it South Dakota State? Their defense is better than Iowa State's. They held them to 150 total yards. Only three third down conversions and uh, 58 yards rushing. So maybe there's a glimmer of hope for Oklahoma when we play Iowa State. I that's crazy, man. That's crazy. I was I was off. It's so bad. It's crazy. I don't know. Like, would you just look at the statistics? I mean, Iowa State statistically had like a fairly normal game. I think they had like 350 yards of total offense. How did they not beat them worse than that? I Decker's <laughs> Decker's threw it to the other team one too many times. They also fumbled. Like they they made some they made some big mistakes and were still Tried able to, to overcome it. them because Iowa's offense is just I mean it's brutal, man. But I'm happy for Matt Campbell. Yeah. It's a nice yeah. win. Good for Iowa State. Yeah. All right, but my loser of the weekend, Scott Frost. It happened. Now we we knew the writing was on the wall after the Northwestern loss, right? But thought that they would wait until that October first date when when the buyout gets cut in half. But when you lose to Georgia, what was it? Georgia Southern is that yeah. the right is that the right school? Another Fun Belt team, Marshall, uh, Georgia Southern, and App State. Yeah, when when you take an L in Lincoln to Georgia Southern. Uh, you get fired. That's that's how it works. And yeah, went ahead and made the move. Georgia Southern had 642 yards of offense, by the way, in that game, which is just unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But when when it comes to the Scott Frost stuff, it just it, it didn't work the way that a lot of people thought it would work. He never got the offense going. Uh, I thought what Nebraska's AD Trev Albert said kind of described it. He's like, this is a day I hoped would never come. And it's just kind of a bummer, man, because it's this type of situation. You, you want the guy to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. Played there was, you know, was the quarterback there, won a national title there coming back to lead the alma mater. And it just, it never came together for him. They could never get things going offensively. Just never nope. could. So. Uh, we knew it was coming, but it's official now. And now Nebraska looking for a new head coach. And I'm sure some Kansas Jayhawk fans are looking and say, hey, please don't. Please don't. Well, I don't know who they'll hire, but. I don't either. I they can no pay. Idea. They can pay a lot of money. I know that. So Gary Patterson. I have, I have no idea. Um. This seems so dumb to me by Nebraska. What, what good does it do you making the move now instead of October 1st? What, that's 20 days away? And you can save $7.5 million? Is, does making this move I is is this going to save your season? Is this going to I? What are you doing? You might as well wad up and burn seven point five million dollars, unless it's like a, you know, good old boy slap you on the back. We're buddies, uh, Trev Alberts and Scott Frost. Which hey, I'm happy for Scott Frost. You know, it just seems like a total waste of money for the athletic department of Nebraska, right? It <laughs> it does. Uh, it does feel that way, but I, I guess the one thing is, okay, 
you know, if, if you keep him for these next couple of weeks, I, I honestly think they fired him just so he couldn't coach the OU game and try to save his job. Yeah. Well, right? if we've seen anything these last couple of weeks in college football, you don't really know, man. Like college football could be weird. If you give them the opportunity to coach that game, they play OU well. Maybe they even win it. I don't think that's going to happen, but right. It's college football. Anything can happen, right? Well, I, I don't think they wanted him to have the opportunity to coach I'm, that football game. I'm with you. Um, well, that's the other part of this thing. This is a disaster for Oklahoma. Like, this is not what you want. You do not want to go face a team that just got embarrassed, that just got their head coach fired. They've got an interim now. Every team always plays their absolute ass off one time for the interim guy, right? One time. So, I, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, God, no, no, no. Why? Why? Why, Nebraska? Because I... you, you know, just like I do, you, you know, like, how – it's like it's written in the book. Like, this is just, they're going to go out and play their absolute asses off, and it's going to be like a storybook day for Nebraska. Now, they're not going to win, but they're going to play a really, really good football game. I, I'll i be surprised if they don't. <laughs> yeah. And this defense who, I don't even know. Like, what happened to Nebraska's defense? It was a pretty solid group. I know they lost some guys off last year's team, but their defense is horrible. Oh, well, they looked god awful against Northwestern. Yeah, and they looked Ireland. even even worse against Georgia Southern, giving up 642. Brutal. I don't know, man. I I, I don't know. I I would have let Scott Frost try and go beat Oklahoma and still fired him on October 1st even if he did beat Oklahoma. I I would have if to save saved seven and a half million dollars, yeah. I like it's just be like, hey, just want to let you know, October 1st, we're going to fire you no matter what happens in this game. So, hey, eh, sorry. It's probably how I would approach it <laughs> as well. But also, like, what is, you know, how matter Nebraska fans? How does that affect you financially? Like, is, is them being pissed off for 20 more days? Like, would it cost you in the long run more than seven and a half million? I don't know. I don't know. I'd how hold to crunch a press conference numbers. and say, listen, fans, we're firing Scott Frost on October first to save seven and a half million dollars just so you know he's still going to be here uh maybe even demote him i don't know if you can demote him what his contract says or whatever but yeah you know i don't know i think it's i think it's hilarious but i'm happy my theory has been that scott frost is trying as hard as he can to get fired before october 1st and he got it done it just took a georgia southern loss job well done uh, <laughs> ended up Never having a winning season as Nebraska's coach, 16 and 31 overall, uh, five and 22 in one score games in his career there. Uh, and this is an interesting one since 2018, the only big 10 school to have a worse overall ne record than Nebraska is Rutgers. Oh, it it hurts me to read that. It what hurt was, me. There was another stat like Nebraska was like two hundred and fourteen and zero when they've scored over thirty five points, and now they're two hundred and fourteen and one. I guess like, they've never lost a game. So it's something. It's over two hundred games. Jeez. Crazy. Who are you hiring if you're Nebraska? I don't it's a good know. job. Like it's a big 10 job. I mean, it's who, let me ask you this. Who wants it? I don't know. I, I think the level of investment, like from everything I can tell, like there's relatively good alignment is the word you hear. Like they got all the resources in the world. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. Urban well, Matt Meyer. Campbell, try to get Matt Campbell. God, well, I mean, yeah, you try to get Matt Campbell, but I, I think if Matt Campbell's about to be in the big 12 with a good chance to be one of the top dogs. Yeah. I don't think he's going to leave and they're paying him a ton. 
now to so I I think if if I was putting a list together for Nebraska, right? I want my team to be physical uh just because of the type of players we're going to be able to recruit. I'm hoping Matt Rule gets fired from the Panthers and I'm hoping I can convince him to be the next Nebraska coach. Boy, that's that would be an absolute home run hire if they could get Matt Rule. Yeah. But yeah. Lots got to happen for that to work out for him. So I don't, I don't know. know. You know, you, you got to feel like a lot of folks are going to see like Scott Frost is good coach, good pedigree. You know, I just could not get anything going at all at Nebraska. You know, money talks and some everyone's always going to feel like they can go in there and, and change it. But I just don't know how many people are going to be how many top guys like someone will take it. There's no doubt, but I don't know how many of the top targets are going to be like, yeah, I don't know. I wonder how quickly Scott Frost is going to be an analyst at Bama. I thought he's going to be an analyst at Oklahoma. I'd be all for it. Why not? Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Episode 248 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Wednesday. We'll preview OU Nebraska. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great week. And until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.